It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to a special episode of Science on Top. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hello. And today we're interviewing a science writer, a researcher with a particular interest in orality, how societies communicate and store information without writing things down. Dr. Lynn Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ed, and hello to Lucas and Penny as well. <laughs> hey. So I mentioned in the introduction orality. Um, can you explain further what that is? It's O-R-A-L-I-T-Y. A lot of people hear morality and we don't have any of that. Now, <laughs> or- Not on this show. <laughs> <laughs> it's what you have when you don't have literacy. And people keep talking about Indigenous cultures not having writing, but they have an alternative. They, an orality is a complex of memory systems that enable them to memorise vast amounts of information and communicate it. Okay. That's a very <laughs> succinct <laughs> way of putting it. Well, I can browse if you want me to. Well, we're basically we're talking spoken oral traditions, aren't we? Um, communicating stories and using those stories as metaphors and analogies. Is that right? Yes, spoken is a very simplistic way of looking at it because information is performed and they not only use speech... But, and I'm talking about Australian Aboriginal, Native American, Pacific African, they use dance and song because they are both memory forms and they will use rhythms and sign languages and a whole complex way along with a whole lot of memory devices. So to think of it just as spoken is the reason that literate cultures didn't recognise the complexity of information because they were only listening to a spoken form. Right. So when I hear about dreamtime stories or the ways that Aboriginals have passed on their information, it often just sounds like, you know, children's stories type thing. It's a sort of simplistic way of talking about kangaroos and plants and everything. But is that because there's a hidden meaning that I'm not getting or is that just the sort of what we tell the foreigners kind of thing? No, it's because you're hearing the children's stories that they sound like children's stories. So what Indigenous cultures do is ground their information, as in they link all these stories to locations in the landscape and other places. That grounds them and they're taught as a knowledge structure. And then on that they build layer upon layer of information. But to get those extra layers, you need to be initiated. So you'll only hear the stories that are told to the children before initiation, which grounds the system. Now, all those characters you keep say, hearing about act out all the information and the pragmatic scientific information, which is my particular field of interest. And so they acted out and it's a completely different way of knowing stuff. So, Linda, are there specialties, like looking at Aboriginal culture for, for, um, specifically, obviously the elders are sort of the guardians, the keepers of, of knowledge. Are they, do they kind of, do certain elders specialise in certain areas of knowledge for their culture? Yes. A fully initiated Aboriginal elder will have a pretty good idea of everything. And mm. that's what changes when we get to Stonehenge and all of that. That's what changes once the population gets much bigger, and if you look at the um, American Indian, and they, a lot of them prefer the term Indian, so I'm not being politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. They do things differently. But within Australian Aboriginal cultures, an elder will have grasp of almost everything, and we are talking massive amounts of information. But there will be specialist healers. There will be some specialists because the healers will know the entire pharmacopoeia, and we are talking mm. a thousand plants because you've not only got to know what is useful, you've also got to know what isn't or what's even harmful because you can't test everything every generation. Yeah. So we've got, it's very hard to get the documented evidence on this, but we've got cases like with the Navajo, they have documented 700 insects, the fully classified and mm. all stored in memory. 
So there without identity, writing anything down? Not None of it written down, all right. stored in memory, and that's just insects. Now add all the mammals and the reptiles and the birds and then add all in the plants, and then we get to navigation. The song lines, Aboriginal song lines, we know from the Yanua people, they've so far mapped 800 kilometres of navigation of singing tracks of song lines that they can navigate, 800 kilometres, all stored in memory. Wow. It's, That's just amazing. I and can't this, even remember where I left my keys. I used, to, <laughs> I used systems now. I can remember anything, and I used to, to be able to remember the day of the week, which is why in my PhD, which was not supposed to be on memory systems, I was supposed to be on the scientific knowledge, I started to ask the question, how the hell do they do it? <laughs> and it derailed my entire PhD and set me a completely different direction. So I've seen a, a lot of your, um, you know, comments on Facebook and, and so forth about your journey with learning memory palaces and, and how to use these techniques. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience for you? Yes, I had a lot of trouble understanding because I'm, you know, literate, well, brought up well and truly in a literate society. I couldn't understand how these worked. So I started, once I understood with an Aboriginal song line, so basically, as you walk through the bush on a singing track, sung track, at each specific location, information stored. So a, a significant rock and then to under a significant tree. A ritual is performed. Now, rituals are repeated events. There's nothing hoo-ha about them. They're repeated <laughs> events. And most of them will be a song or a story acted out. And that will store information about where the best flint is stored where the nearest water hole is because they can get through desert with, you know where you'd swear there's no water they'll get it and uh all the information about all those plants all those animals so each location acts as a memory device and i thought well this sounds okay but i wasn't convinced mm. so i started mapping out locations myself around home and storing information in them. I had to put information that was relevant to me because otherwise you can't get emotionally involved with it. And that turned out to be really important. And I was astounded how effective this memory system was. For someone who can't remember the day of the week, I could start remembering all sorts of complex information. And then I re read about um, memory palaces and the Greek and Roman orators and the method of Loki, their method of locations, and realised that Australian Aboriginal people are doing this. It was not invented by the Greeks and Romans. Aboriginal song lines, Native American pilgrimage trail, Pacific ceremonial roads, they're all memory palaces. They all walk, work the same way. So can we just delve more into the memory palace system then? So you're talking about locations and uh, associating memories with different features, is that right? Yeah, so if you do in your own house... So say we started putting in the countries of the world, as I've got here, uh, the countries of the world in population order. So you start <laughs> China at, at your first location. So that's, you know, we'll put five in a room. So if you enter where whatever room you're in now, the first location might be a table or a wall or something. You put China by associating it with Chinese food, by smashing a bit of China against it any in your imagination or reality, anything. <laughs> Your second location, uh, put in India. And in the third location in your room, I want you to imagine that now. And I want you to imagine Donald Trump there. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> You've ruined my whole way, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> so what you do is associate information. Of course, Aboriginal people do entire songs and ceremonies at locations. So they're adding complexity to it. And once you've got it that way, if you use some kind of mnemonic like the first letter of China's C and the second mm. letters of first of India is I and A is uh, USA is U and came up with some mnemonic, you couldn't add layer upon layer of information. However, if you have that location, wherever you've got Donald Trump, you can now start using every detail there to add all the information you want about USA and you'll find it'll just build and build and build. Okay, so... We're talking sort of memorising lists a lot of the time. Is that 
mainly what we're talking about or is it also other sort of memory like I've got to where, where, where do I left my car keys for example or things like that is it a list based thing well it depends it must be structured because unstructured information is lost so if something is on the internet and it's mm-hmm. not indexed then Google can't find it you can't find it at essentially doesn't exist and that was a really critical for when we get to the archaeology because these memory palaces or memory spaces the uh, object in them stones timbers whatever must be in a sequence because a, and if we ever find random standing stones or random posts my theory falls over no one's come up with any yet because that sequence enables you to recall it and repeat it so every fifth location is I have something significant there. It's what the Greek and Romans used to do. So I can check that I haven't lost any location. So I'll put five in a room and mm-hmm. down the street every time I get to a, a particular road, I'll make sure every fifth one's a road or something like that. So it is has to be structured. But if you want to remember car keys or something, then you set up a system. So I now know my car keys must go in one particular location, which I have visualised, and I get edgy now if I see my car keys anywhere else, which mm-hmm. makes them in the right place. So, yes, it's, 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 there's a whole lot of systems. The memory Palace might be the main system for Greek orators and that, but Aboriginal, Native American and so on use much more complex combinations of systems. Right. So uh, Native Americans, uh, do they have similar approaches with song lines, uh, as you mentioned before, with Aborigines? Yes, but they're now settled, but they still use the landscape that way. Mm-hmm. But they, other things will take over as well. But, yes, absolutely, and they're called pilgrimage trails. Okay. And the Pueblo people, who are the main ones I've worked with, uh, still do the pilgrimages. They're elders at um, it's not necessarily a chief, but their knowledge right. specialists will still do the pilgrimages and do all the songs and rituals to make sure that information is not lost. And that's the <laughs> cruelty of moving people from their landscape. Mm, yeah. and Native Americans were moved off their landscape to reservations. What are you complaining about? The land's better. You're walking them away from their entire encyclopedia all the knowledge of their culture and their physical information, it's critical. And here we put fences across song lines and shot their Aboriginals if they crossed the fences. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. We didn't yeah. only do such physical cruelty but intellectual cruelty. Mm-hmm. And so much as a result is, is, is lost, but, you know. It's, um, but it's, it's heartening to see how much more uh, academic interest there's been in this. I, I certainly it seems to me in more recent years, um, you know, and you're, yourself contributing to that. I, I, I last saw you at uh, Sw- uh, Swinburne Uni. We were at the Aboriginal um, Astronomy event that yeah. that evening, if you recall. That was uh, that was amazing. I, I, I mentioned that to the... Yes, I work with Dwayne quite a lot. He's astounding. And the... The respect for Indigenous science in particular is growing massively, mm. but we've left it awfully late. But yes. some research that Dwayne's showing and some of the other researchers is that some of these knowledge stories of the landscape date back five, seven, ten thousand 10,000 years, possibly mm. a lot more, and mm. they wow. managed to keep that information accurate for that length of time through oral technology. <laughs> but... What is critical is that they have secret business. You keep hearing about secret men's, mm. secret women's business. If it wasn't for secret business, that information would be lost because secret business stops the Chinese whispers effect. It stops ah, okay. being corrupted by being talked about too much. So the most important stuff, the song lines, the landscape stuff, trade agreements, are held at very, very high initiated levels and they always have a number of elders confirming each other, only fully initiated people, and they're very strict about who knows that information and how it's repeated so it is kept accurate. 7,000 years, 10,000 years 
landscape changes, and, and there's now quite a lot of research showing those. I, I'm stunned that I've got to this point in my life and not realised that the secret business actually had a purpose other than just, you know, saving words and not having to explain it to people coming onto their land. That's oh, that's no. amazing. It, it, well, my thesis, my PhD thesis was called When Knowledge Was Power because control of information in all the cultures that I look at, the control of information is what gives power. The cultures that do not have individual material wealth and they don't use violence against their own people to to keep their elites in power. Mm. So these are cultures where knowledge is power. Uh, once we get past that, things start changing again. But these that's why these systems will show up in the archaeology or in the cultural um, landscapes of people where the knowledge is the important system. So it is power but it's power for a very good reason because without it, they wouldn't survive. Yeah. And then obviously these um, these techniques of storing knowledge have extended right across the world to different cultures, different civilizations. And your uh, obviously more recent work with uh, Stonehenge and other hinges and so forth has been incredibly groundbreaking. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I can, but just I want to go back to what you said is extended across I'm having some discussions online with some academics at the moment. But I don't believe that the people at Stonehenge and the Native Americans, Aboriginal cultures, knew each other or communicated with each other. Mm. I think that the reason that they all use the similar methods independent, you know, put in, implemented differently, a different culture, but underneath all the methods are the same, is because of the human brain. That's the mm. common factor. And there's quite a lot of neuroscience coming out now about the way the grid cells work and the cerebellum. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. I only know what I'm getting in emails from neuroscientists. I will know what I'm talking about eventually. Uh, but there is no doubt that the human brain is structured in a way that uses space and places and music uh, to en and vivid stories and imagination to enhance memory. Mm. So uh, it, it's the human brain's the common factor, not teaching each other the methods. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you want Stonehenge. <laughs> we're we're dying to know about Stonehenge. <laughs> Okay, I I wasn't. I had no interest in archaeology. My husband Damien dragged me along to Stonehenge when I wanted to go to Bath to Jane Austen's house, but he insisted. <laughs> and I was immersed in these memory systems at that stage, and I went there knowing nothing about the place, and listening to the tourist stuff, they were talking about, you know, all sorts of funny stuff, but not mentioning memory or intellect at all. Now, Stonehenge initially, the big guys in the middle, the trilithons, weren't there for the first 500 years. So initially it was a circle about 100 metres across of probably 56. I'm just going on the archaeology reports. I'm not arguing with any of them. Uh, about 100 metres across, 56 of the blue stones from Wales is the latest theory, the latest evidence. Um, in those, those holes... And so what you've got is a circle of stones. Now, my brain just said, what's going to happen when you stop hanging laps around the 800 kilometres of landscape as our Australian Aboriginal people are mobile? They have not been nomadic for as long as anything, but they, a lot of them will move between a number of different locations and they will know this broad landscape and move for ceremonies and so on. Mm. What happens when you're not moving anymore but you can't afford to lose that information. And farming takes a long time to set up, so it's a transition. Uh -huh. And I just thought, oh, beauty, they've just, how clever, they've just uh, model. replicated, exactly, made a model of it locally. And there's an intermediary stage called cursus, but we won't get into all the detail. <laughs> but so what they've done is essentially localised a model of the sites that they are using for key information so that they keep practising. And, and stones, especially the blue stones from Wales, which are known for being all notchy and blotchy, mm. are really good for creating images with. But that's not enough. I mean, it had to be sequenced, and there's a 1,000 stone circles all over the um, British Isles and Western Europe. But I've got nine other 
aspects that had to be in the archaeology to convince me this was a memory space because my immediate reaction there was, oh, that's a clever idea. You would, if there was any thing in that, somebody else would have thought of it first. Somebody's yeah. probably thought of it and mm-hmm. deleted it. So I was only elated for about 10 minutes. And, <laughs> and then I got back to uni, upset my poor supervisor by saying I've got this new theory for Stonehenge. Um, <laughs> Approached the archaeology department at La Trobe, hoping they would convince me what was wrong with it so I could get back to my lovely thesis and my book contract from Alan and Unwin. Um, but they didn't want to talk to a nutter with a... <laughs> <laughs> Understandably so. Anyway, so I started looking at all the other aspects that are essential for a, a memory system, a, a memory palace in the more complex form that Indigenous cultures use. Uh, So I needed performance spaces, public and restricted. Mm -hmm. I needed handheld portable devices. I'll talk about that in a moment. I needed no evidence of um, individual wealth, which there isn't. The the burials at Stonehenge are right at the end. That's when things start to change and then they abandon it. I'm trying to remember, acoustic enhancement, astronomical alignments, there's 10 indicators, they're all on my website, that I wanted all of them there before I was happy, or at least nine of them. It's a long story, the cave art's not there. So then I started looking at these in terms of all of these things. So the ditches, which are flat-bottomed around the hinges, Mm -hmm. two metres deep at Stonehenge, why did they go to so much work chopping into chalk, which is a stone, no metal work, just deer antlers, for right round, which they estimate, you know, probably a million work hours or something. Mm. Uh, and there was no explanation, but they, the performance is essential. We know they were meeting in midwinter because of the pig, pig skeletons and things. So... All I said was they've created cut a ditch because British weather's not renowned. There's no way they're performing in the middle for people sitting on the bank at the outside, 50 metres away in a British winter. You know, what they've done is dug themselves a ditch, perform in that, chalks white, the torches. Um, so it's a shelter. And, yeah, like exactly. And cover it. Exactly. And it's in segments going around. So they were using different segments Oh, and there were deposits in it and everything. I can go on about hinge ditches for hours. Um, so what you've got is them performing the different ceremonies and the ditch segments are sort of if it's a big group does this ceremony, it's a bigger segment. If it's a, you know, highly restricted performance, it's a smaller segment. And so that for about 500 years, but then they moved the bluestones into the middle from Wales, brought down the great big ones that you can see in the centre, which the Sarsons, mm. they bought them from my um, Mayor Marlborough. Marlborough. I say it wrongly. <laughs> anyway, 30 kilometres up the road, which was actually harder than getting the blue stones from mm. Wales, and erected those round the blue stones, did a whole lot of other stuff, and you've now got, and let the ditch uh, silt up. So you've now got a highly restricted site with great acoustics, but terribly restricted, and that left me in a mess because there's no public site. As it happened, um, I was rescued by um, the late research, the last 10 years' research, which shows that Durrington Walls was built three kilometres up the road, three miles <coughs> up the road, uh, a massive site. The ditch is 10 metres deep because once they realised what the acoustics and visibility were like, they just kept going down and down. It's the ditch is a kilometre around and it's got all sorts of things, public and restricted sites and everything there. Wow. It's Ten metres deep. That would have taken forever to dig. That was clearly an important place. Right, and Avebury's got the same. Uh, that's 30 miles up the road and Avebury's got massive, all sorts of stuff up there. Anyone who's been to Avebury, it's, it's sort of overwhelming. But that ditch is still quite deep 5,000 years later. So they didn't do that for nothing. Mm. And in my book I've got the drawings from an artist that shows that those great big stones at Avebury that you think are amazing, if you actually add the ditch in, the stones are totally dwarfed. The ditch was much more important. Wow. 
So yeah, it's extraordinary what they did. So the ditches are used for performance and um, storytelling and like like plays, I assume, uh, for the audience. So music what- is critical because music makes everything more memorable. So most yes. Uh, is performed. You can remember songs from your childhood when you can't yeah. remember anything. I, I just, I often marvel at how many song lyrics are in my head that I can sing along to so many damn things, but useful information. I mean, I'm not saying that's <laughs> useless, but, you know, th- there are other things I would love to be able to remember with such clarity. In the shower each night, I sing the 82 bird families for the Victorian birds. I can do the whole 412 birds, but I that's sing... That's a really long shower. <laughs> I, I never get through the whole ADD. And start from where I left off. <laughs> but um, yes, so I sing useful information now. So I, I keep the tunes. That one I've made up the tune to fit the mm. rhythm of the family names. Yes, Indigenous cultures sing useful information. We remember the songs, and they're all about <coughs> love, falling in love, losing love, falling in love again. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's There's so many songs about some dude named Hugh. It's like, I will always love Hugh. Who is this guy? <laughs> I don't know. I keep in every damn song. Yeah, Sorry. it's sad, isn't it? Dad humor. Yeah. It's interesting though, because I was reading your book and I thought, well, what a lot of effort, you know, to have to sing all those songs and do these rituals and repeat it. And then I thought about the amount of effort we go to to study and learn, but not necessarily remember anything. Mm. Yeah, like, and- I'm a teacher, and you can. You know, teach a kid chemistry in the next year. It's like they never did anything. Yes, and I'm working in schools at the moment. Mm. These methods will work alongside literacy. Uh, Yeah, it sounds like you're actually doing more work. The thing is that the retention is much higher. And the other thing that concerns me greatly, and it concerns Socrates, Mm. we're going back a little, even before I was born, uh, (laughs) (laughs) that writing would stop you using your memories properly mm-hmm. and now we've gone way past that and it's only since I've been doing this that I'm starting to see all sorts of patterns because I've got this firm basis of information on which I'm building. So all the countries in the world, if we kept going, we would have got to number eight, which is Bangladesh, eighth biggest in the world by population and it's a country we almost never hear about. Mm. Why? So immediately you start asking why. And that's what's happening is because I'm recording this information and keeping it in my head, I have all the periodic table, I have all sorts of things, I can then build on it because it gives you hooks to build information. Mm. So I asked some Bangladeshis why, and it's partly because it's a new country um, and resource poor and all sorts of other things, but now I've now got a location to hook all that onto. Mm. How so do you? I, oh, sorry, sorry. Go on, Penny. How do you no, modify no. it? Like, just say um, the population order changes. Would that get confusing if you've, you've been got remembering down a, a merit? wall? Yeah, <laughs> build a different wall. I move the door uh, to a different place in the the room. No. <laughs> Oral traditions are dynamic. They're mm-hmm. not stagnant. They keep adding to them. So mm-hmm. if Bangladesh then swapped places with Russia, which it could well do because they're very similar populations, I would add to the story, which is what I just did in my head, I just checked my stories, um, that, you know, I, I add something to the story that told me that Bangladesh, unless you know where I'm thinking, because I have to mm-hmm. do this by going to those locations in my imagination. Mm. Um, But it's only when once you've got that, you can add that to the story. So I have a a history trail that starts at 4,000, 4,500 million years ago and then goes all the way up to the present. By the present, I've got a location for every year, but back then I don't or I'd be around the planet. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But if you mention any time in history or any new event now, I've got a location to hook it on to. And if I want to look at, say, the year 1200, I don't have to remember any dates. I go to the corner of Randall present in uh, <laughs> Pennsylvania and I can see King John on the throne in um, America. I can see in America, England. <laughs> I can see Great Zimbabwe flush, flourishing in 
Africa. I can see what the Song Dynasty finishing in China. I'm not remembering that these are all concurrent. Mm. I'm standing there and looking at all what hooks I've got hanging around me. I can tell you what's before and after because when you give me different locations, so I'm starting to see patterns. And neither the Aztec nor the Inca have even started yet. The Maya have been going right round the block. <laughs> you mentioned before the importance of emotion in, in the memory systems. How, how, what, what is the role there? I mean, I, I immediately think of, of songs and the emotional connection I have with, with music, but is, is it a similar sort of scenario that you, because you said you have to have the emotion for it to stick? It sticks much better if you've got an emotional attachment. I'm now so attached to the landscape and this house and the garden and everywhere and all the shops in Casamayne that have all got countries and all sorts of things. (laughs) I can't move. I I could never leave here. It Because my landscape is now dynamic. Mm. And as I walk around, you know, I might chat to St Augustine, who I'm actually getting quite fond of. Um, He used these memory methods and wrote about them quite beautifully. I know that Cicero is this side of him and I know that Muhammad's around the corner. And um, these people are now real characters mm. and they're all in my landscape. I, I, it's very hard to explain the completely different relationship between landscape. Now, this is something I've been doing for a couple of years. Can you imagine an Indigenous child growing up in this, hearing all the stories that go back generation after generation? Mm. Mm. Growing up with these stories in this landscape, their relationship to that landscape must be absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so we talk about this being uh, used all around the world. You mentioned um, the Pueblo people, the um, the Incas and Navajo. Yeah. Navajo, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, we're all talking about henges and uh, location-based things. Uh, when this episode goes out, I'll actually be on holiday in France where I'm hoping to go to some of the ancient caves uh, like Lascaux with the rock art and everything. And you, you mentioned rock art. Was that also yeah. used for storytelling and memory as well or was it, or, or do we not know even what it was for? Australia has a culture that is continuous for 40, 50, 60,000 years hmm. and we know how they use rock art and continually update it and what's really important with that and the emotional attachment and everything else is these characters that act out the stories ancestors the pueblo people call them kachina they've got about 250 that act out the stories that makes the information far more emotionally attached but that's what you're seeing on the cave walls at lascaux and that you've got the incredible horses Mm. and all the rest but there's a whole lot of abstract images too. And abstract images enable restricted information to be stored because if you haven't been taught the songs, you have no idea what those images are. But people don't mention them because they're not as pretty. Mm. Um, and that's what's critical. So these portable devices that I'm so keen on tend to be abstract. Let's go and those you're talking a lot earlier in much smaller populations with caves. Yeah. Then as they get bigger, you get more permanent locations. But there's a lot of acoustic experiments showing that the cave art will be in the locations with the greatest resonance. Oh, wow. And also there's some that's way, way difficult to get to, but Mm. that's part of initiation and restricted. Of course. Right. It it all works, um, but it takes a lot of time to explain it all sure. but the cave art is just stunning again we can learn more from australian aboriginal cultures than we can from anyone else in the world because we have the longest continuous cultures here and australian the aboriginals they don't just preserve the cave art they actually go and touch up and revitalize it uh, ongoing don't they because it's it's a part of oral tradition which is dynamic so when the macassans from indonesia started trading with the Yongu and up north and up in Arnhem Land, they added them into the, the cave art because they're part of their information system. And, yes, they touch it up constantly as they're telling the stories as part of the rituals. That's part of the way of keeping it alive. So 
right around the world you've got the same sorts of things in cave art. Often it's animals that are not there. Mm -hmm. They're animals they know of from elsewhere or they're not the ones they hunted because they're the stories because animals make really good characters. If you think of Bunjil um, from Victoria, one of the main creative spirit here, and there's origin stories everywhere because that's how everything gets named. He morphs between being an eagle, a wedge-tailed eagle, and being a human. Mm -hmm. And that gives you the emotional attachment. His stories can serve a number of purposes. And that's what you'll see in cave art too, these morphing of characters. Very cool. And, okay, so you keep talking about these portable devices, um, which, I, and I know have been independently found in various different cultures uh these little and they can be all sorts of different materials but they're basically anything with characteristic notches or nodules or bumps that you can use to associate with a story is that right yeah i've got them in front of me it's good for a podcast yeah we can't see that (laughs) (laughs) Uh, these this is one of the most for me, one of the most exciting areas of the research because no one had put together that these were everywhere. But Aboriginal people talk about coolamon, you know, the food dishes that they carry with the food, but on the back they've got a whole lot of abstract etchings or incisions, and that's used as a memory device. Um, the chiringa are highly restricted and message sticks and so on. So one that I came across was from the West African Luba people called the Lakasa, and that's what I'm holding in my hand. It's a, a chunk of wood with beads and shells stuck on and bits of carving and stuff. And according to the research from people that have been initiated into the Luba first level, um, they could encode massive amounts of information to this bit of wood with stuff glued on or nailed on in their case. I decided that this was a load of rubbish. This is getting really a bit far-fetched. So I grabbed a bit of wood, the one I've got in front of me, whacked some beads on. I didn't even put them neatly and tidily and um, shells and that and started encoding the birds of Victoria, the 412. I say 408 in the book, but I've had to add four. (laughs) Um, Beachstone curlew has been recorded here, things like that. And so it's dynamic, just um, the way Penny was asking before. And I started touching a particular shell. So the one I'm touching at the moment is the um, ducks. As you can see, there's a little tiny speck on it. None of you can see anything. Little tiny speck, and I imagined that speck was a duck tail. I cannot look at that shell now and not see that duck tail. So then I've got 12 ducks, and so I made a story to go with the natter day. So when I sing it, I sing the family names. Uh, so, and it starts with the magpie goose and five ducks later as the swan. So I decide to have a footy match with the magpies against the swans. We've got the hardheads having a brawl, um, the Australian shoveler burying all those that didn't survive the brawl. The <laughs> musk is, is um, musk cologne on having it off in the bushes. And so I just created this story that linked the 16 ducks in taxonomic order. And I just kept doing it for the whole thing. I could not believe that I can do this. And it works unbelievably well. A bit of wood with beads on. We've now been doing workshops um, quite a lot um, with various people, kids and adults, uh, learning to make their own, except that we're actually setting them up to match what they're trying to learn. And people just cannot believe how well this device works. It's tactile. I don't need it with me anymore. Mm-hmm. I know it. Getting picture well. it so clearly. Yeah. yeah. Every now and then I sketch it. And Indigenous cultures often use ephemeral art. They'll draw something, make something, and then ditch it because it's the process that I've created. Right. right. Okay. So I started finding these devices in all cultures. So then I said, well, then if I'm saying Stonehenge is a memories palace, there must be these devices mm. at Stonehenge. And, yes, it's page 300 and something of the, the great big massive book on all the archaeology of Stonehenge, but there's things called the Stonehenge chalk plaques, um, and these are about the same size as the Lucasa in chalk and carved with etching, you know, you know with abstract mm-hmm. patterns. 
And then in Scotland, they've got carved stone balls um, from the Neolithic. These are stone and they're perfect to hand, hell, hold. And I showed a photo of the most fancy one of them, the Towie ball, to an Aboriginal elder, and he said, oh, they've done their Chiringas balls. That's <laughs> good. Now let me tell you something about uh -huh. and this one. I recognise it. Wow. But to him, it was obviously a memory device. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Asks Aboriginal elders what mm. these archaeological devices, but it's because non-literate thinking is mm. different. It's not mm. less intellectual. Yeah. Can you, um, just, just on that, you, you've been, um, I remember you were telling me about the Repskillians when, uh, when I oh, yeah. saw you last and, and, and their role with, uh, with students. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I, I can't believe the impact of Repskillians. So, you know, I was talking about the way that the characters act out information. So mm. um, it, it, everything's more interesting if it's got characters doing things. So we started pinching that idea. The Pueblo people call them Kachina. They have about 250 and they make dolls of them, which the children have. They also paint them, they dance them, they back them. The children, they're not play dolls as much as learning the characters that form the information system. So we started trying this with the kids at Malmesbury Primary School, getting them to make characters, to act out their mathematical tables, to argue with them when they're doing what are those not argumentative essays, the ones where they've got to convince people of things. Anyway, persuasive. Oh, yeah, yeah. Persuasive. persuasive writing, yeah. uh, so doing persuasive, whack a character, a toy, or in this case in art, they made these characters on the table in front of them. They got much more persuasive. And then we said the Rapscallion doesn't agree with you, write their argument. <laughs> it just changed it. So in French, we got a boy rapscallion and a girl rapscallion, and the French teacher was doing, um, I'm learning French now, I've been doing it for over a week, and I can't believe how much it makes difference. But she was doing the bakery. So all the masculine things you could get a bakery, a croissant and so on, were handed to the boy rapscallion. And all the, the baguette and feminine things were handed to the girl rapscallion. And all these little kids were learning whether they were masculine or feminine. And then she played this game where they had to bring up their rapscallion. And if it was male, it was only allowed to buy boy stuff. And if it was female, it was only allowed to buy girl stuff. And every kid, these were five-year-olds, were getting it right. That because wow, they had image in their mind of whether it was a boy item or a girl item. Mm. And Rapscallions started chatting to each other and saying things in French. The amount it added, and it's added to maths tables by giving the numbers characters and having the Rapscallions interacting with those characters. It's just unbelievable the difference it does. Now that I, I was hopeless at French at school, mm. now that I'm learning this way, I've got two bears, a girl bear and a boy bear, and my boy bear has to have the bra each morning, which he's not very pleased about. But bra is masculine, so that's uh, that's the way it goes. So I just bought my clothes in the morning for the two bears. They help with the cooking. Um, the knife is held by the boy bear, the fork by the girl bear. I'm, all I'm doing now is closing my eyes and seeing who did what. And so the knife, le couteau, um, it, the boy bear had the knife and it was cutting his toe. And he was getting upset because the knife was cutting his toe, which gave me le couteau, ah, gave me that. Cut toe. But once I use it a few times, I forget those associations because I know the word. And so I'm just using that to get the words in my head in the first place. It is just working so well. I'm in love with rapscallions. <laughs> we called them that because we couldn't call them ancestors or mythological beings or hmm. kachina or anything that would be culturally insensitive. So we... Called, we being the, the people I'm working with, called them rapscallions. That's brilliant. I'm going to have to borrow those bears when I go to France now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Nah, I'll it's invent my not. own. <laughs> so are you, going to, are you going to take that to any other schools? Have you, are you involved with any other uh, groups? At this stage, I've just been commissioned by my publisher to write all this stuff up that there's a whole lot more to on all these different memory methods. I'm mm. entering the Australian Memory Championships this year, um, which I never wow. thought I'd be able to do anything like that. Uh, 
because people at my age, I'm 65, are very worried about losing their memory. Mm, mm. And we know from studies of dementia that using the people with dementia, if they played music yeah. from their past or taken to locations from their past, that they'll come. It comes look, flooding think, back. So how much would it be if we use these methods like Indigenous people do where information was performed in songs and stayed with us and associated with landscape, how much might that uh, reduce the impact of dementia? Are we, in mm. fact, making it worse? All these sorts of questions. So, yes, I am, to get back to am I doing it with other schools, I am working with teachers who are taking it to other schools and writing it up for this book, the new book for Alan Nunwin, and... Um, we are working in a secondary school as well, we being the group at the Orality Centre that we've set mm -hmm. up. We put the, so for visual arts, they have 20 principles and elements for um, VC visual arts. And so we put them in a memory palace. It took about 40 minutes. Um, so shape and tone and all this uh, pattern, all that sort of thing. And the teacher used it. So, for example, shape was done at, a door, which a glass door. So the teacher had the glass door as a geometric shape and the reflection of the kids as an organic shape. He has then used that location as a, a jumping point for whenever they discuss shape in anything. But those kids can reel off the 20 elements and principles that they should be thinking about so easily just by imagining the memory palace. And we did the periodic table into the same memory palace um, so, yeah, trying lots of things with schools, but there's only 24 hours in a day. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of getting the feeling that you, uh, putting myself in your place, you must be both elated but also an, uh, in, to some degree annoyed that you didn't come across this years and years ago. Because just think of how much you could have built by now in your memory palaces. Absolutely. And I was a teacher for 40 years. Mm. Uh, I used, I taught senior physics. I used stories for a few different things, for circuits and that. Um, but I didn't for lots of stuff. I, you know, I missed so much. We could have sung our physics and yeah. sung our maths. And, yeah, it works. Some of the, the kids at the high school were putting in their basic chemistry, you know, what is it, salt plus, um, give salt plus water, acid plus base, give salt plus water. So they had acid as a, as a boy and base as a girl or the other way around, and they created stories about them going to the beach, and I'm not telling you about all the stories. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they got salt plus water, and you know, they, they're never going to forget it. And it, they were killing themselves laughing over their stories. Oh, and it was so, so cool. simple. I love how it works across so many different genres. It literally works for anything that you need to learn. It's terrific. Because it's the way the human brain naturally mm. works. That's the common factor. So you mentioned the um, the memory game. Memory games? Is that what it's called? The memory championships? Championships. So, yeah. So what's, what is what is that comprised of? Is that is that um, the one with the 10 events? Yes. In the, it is. Okay. So it's, it's things uh, like, like random numbers and – sorry, yeah. you go. Yeah. Strings of – so shuffle decks of cards so I can now mm -hmm. memorise – it takes me 15 minutes. I've got to do a lot better than that. But I can memorise a shuffle deck of cards. And, again, you do the same thing. You give each card a character. Right. And that's the way it loses that abstract and start – you can now make stories. So you, uh, thread the, you thread the story of all these characters in one long narrative. No, because you get confused. You take – um, you can give me three cards and I'll tell you the story, but you take three cards. So for each character, it has, this is one of the methods, it has mm -hmm. the character plus the, something they do and something they do it with. So my ace of spades is Homer who eats a donut. And it was, <laughs> it, it's a long story how we got to that. And then, so if I take that and then I had him with, um, uh, name another card, the Queen of Clubs. Oh, that's Pascal. No, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> My head's going through a whole lot of ones. Some of them are not appropriate. <laughs> so, 
All I'm right, noticing a trend here. These these inappropriate <laughs> things. Is yeah. it seriously that the the raunchier things are easier to memory to remember as well? I'm horrified by some of the things my brain comes up with. <laughs> <laughs> if it comes up with those things instantly, I, Occam's razor. Occam is one of my um, characters. He's the two of diamonds. And I now call him Slasher, and you wouldn't believe what he does to every other character. It's horrible. Um, so if I had the Two of Diamonds and then the Ace of Spades, I would have Slasher eating, and now if we have a third one, okay, Cleopatra, who gets bitten by a snake, I've now got Slasher eating a snake. Right. So the image, I now have to put my first location of a memory palace, and right. then I get Another three cards do the same thing and put it in the second location. So I have to create a little tiny story for each location of the memory palace. Wow. So how, how would it go with things like memorizing, memorizing card decks? And I, I uh, saw, it wasn't that long ago, I think you mentioned on Facebook that you'd memorize the, the card yeah. deck uh, for the first time and you were blown away that you were able to do it. Yes. But sure. if you were doing that... <laughs> Yeah, if you're doing that over and over again, do you do you go bogged down by the previous card decks, or are you able to kind of chuck them out and? It's called again? Ghost, ghosting, so you couldn't do it. Well, the good people can do more more in a day, but if I did a, a card deck twice in a day, I get start to get ghosts. It's happening much less now, mm -hmm. but you do the same with numbers. I've got ninety nine characters for zero zero to nine nine, and each of those has a an action and an object and then with binary you I can now do great strings of binary numbers again you convert them to the other numbers and then to the characters so it's always this adding rapscallions to everything mm. rapscallions should be everywhere <laughs> uh, I... and the kids the imagination so when they're doing say um i'm thinking seven eights a a eh, Nine eights are seventy-two. They are, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. So they do a sign. We couldn't do wine because they're little kids. So a sign plus a gate gives seventy-two, which is um, a heavenly shoe. And so they, their rap skelly and had like to we're do bingo something. now. Yeah, I felt like Keno. <laughs> so that's a table they have trouble with. They make up a story where their rap skelly and has a sign, and goes through a gate and ends up finding a heavenly shoe and their definition of a heavenly shoe might be a diamond-encrusted high heel, you know, <laughs> or um, a famous sports person's footy boot, you know, but they will make up those. Unfortunately, we got 49 as a naughty sign. <laughs> some, uh, some of the grade five boys' naughty signs had to be, no, not quite that naughty, please. <laughs> right, right. Which, of course, has made it just more memorable than of ever. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I got in trouble for writing that. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, Lynn, I feel like we've only grazed the surface oh, of dude, some memories. An hour's stuff. gone. I can't I believe know. <laughs> an hour has gone in a blink. We haven't even begun to talk about crocodiles or why you and I disagree vehemently about spiders, for example. You seem oh, to I like them a lot them. more than I do. <laughs> I'm a um, recovered arachnophobe. I overdid the cure and I adore them. You did. So rather than us talking about that, I think our listeners should just buy all your books and learn <laughs> that way. But before we finish up, just more about you and writing books. Like You haven't always been a writer. You said you were a teacher. Have you always been interested in writing, though? No? Uh, always. I used to make little books for my dolls, my rapscallions, when yeah. I was a child. I was always wanting to be a writer. Writing and teaching isn't a lot different. Non-fiction writing really is just talking, uh, teaching without the class in front of you. Mm -hmm. I actually have a whole group of dolls and bears that sit in my study with me and I teach them and that's essentially <laughs> what writing is. Oh, very cool. What is, what's your process then with writing? Like, Do you just sit down and just let it all flow out? Because I very, very rarely will sit down and write a blog post. And I find that I will fuss over every word. I'm a perfectionist. How do you go about writing a whole book? Uh, you have to set time limits and you're never going to be happy with it. <laughs> um, I structure it. So, and then 
structure within the structure down to little bite-sized bits. So basically it's just a whole stack of blogs. Fair enough. Did anyone else have any questions they want to uh, quickly get in before we wrap this up? I have got up? so many more I know. questions. And I, I think we need another like eight-hour-long episode just <laughs> to, to get started. Uh, I'm keen if you're keen, Lynn. <laughs> no worries. All right. Then uh, I guess we'll leave it for another time then. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's been absolutely fabulous hearing all about the memories and all your work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much.